question is from Maxibon Jr. Do macros really matter? Absolutely. They no, definitely, not at all. They, yeah, they definitely matter. Um, it's important to know what is in your food. Know what ma- So macronutrients are proteins, fats, and carbs. And those three macronutrients, macro meaning big, because then you have micronutrients, which are things like your vitamins and your phytonutrients and stuff like that. But each macronutrient has a specific function in the body, and two of them are essential. Okay, What that means is the two essential macronutrients are proteins and fats, and if you don't eat enough of either one of those, you'll have some pretty bad health consequences leading up to eventual uh, death po- possibly i mean you could go so far as to uh co- to cause your body to uh to break down so two of those are essential so you uh, at the very minimum want to know what your minimum r- intake or requirements are for both proteins and fats well and how often did you guys you know especially later in our career when this probably you you probably became more aware of this but how often did you assess a diet and go like oh wow this is probably why you feel this way your fats are extremely low. Right. You know, or you're not getting enough protein. Well, no wonder we're not building any muscle. Totally. You know what I'm totally. saying? So this is where where macros really do matter. Now, it's funny because it's actually I was actually just thinking about doing a post around this. So this is great that we're going this direction. Uh if you if all you cared about was losing ten pounds on the scale, just ten pounds on the scale, then it doesn't matter as much. The most thing the thing that matters the most is calorie restriction, is going from X amount of calories, reducing that by 500, 1,000 calories every single day or creating more calorie expenditure and you will lose weight. Now, the problem with that and what I would see a lot with people that did this, that would, and this is common when you get clients that switch from eating bad food or and by bad, I mean, you know, fast food and, and, and sugar, tons of sugar and processed foods. And then all of a sudden they go to, you know, salads and chicken breast and eating like super low calorie and then running on the treadmill and then they lose 10 pounds. But then we test their body fat when they start, and then we test their body fat again after they've lost this 10 pounds, and you know what happens a lot of the time? They get fatter. Mm. As a percentage. Right. Their mm. body fat goes up, and you're like, well, how does that work? How is that possible? If they lost 10 dramatic. pounds, how could you get fatty? You like how the pause like yeah, that? I was, I was like, just, I was trying to wait for it. <laughs> it's fat. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> well, it, 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 I mean, how many people, I mean, at least for me, this yeah. was common. Did, did you see... That that just demoralized them. How many clients? I mean, I used to have clients where we would do like the the hydrostatic way or body fat test, and even though I was telling them to follow something, they were still kind of doing their own thing. You mm-hmm. know, going doing more cardio, pushing harder, restricting calories. You know, they they turned it into a game. Can I work harder? Can I restrict even more than what Adam's saying? And then we would remeasure a month later. And they're down ten pounds on the scale, and they think they're winning. And they look at the body fat percentage, and it goes up. And they, then they look at me, and they're like, "What the fuck? Well, how right. is that possible? How is that possible? Well, you, if you lose ten pounds of muscle mass, but kept the same amount of fat mass on your body, that total fat mass now is a larger percentage of your overall body weight. And you don't even need to do that. All it has to be is one more pound over. So you could actually, yeah, loo- you, could, you, you could, could lose four pounds of fat. But you lost six pounds of muscle, and, and your you'll be body fat, fat still went and up. your body fat percentage will go up. That's right, because it's the percent, right? If you took the body fat of somebody who's, uh, you know, if you took someone who ten percent body fat, but they weigh one hundred and twenty pounds, and you take their body fat and put it on someone who's got two hundred pounds of lean body mass, that's, you know, they're going to be shredded mm-hmm. uh, because it's about percentage. So that's a very good point. The other thing you want to pay attention to is this: is besides the minimum requirements of the essential macronutrients, proteins, and fats. There's also optimal amounts of especially proteins. Um, Studies are pretty conclusive on this. If you want to maximize the muscle building effects of protein when you combine it with resistance training, you want to eat roughly 0.6 to 1 gram of protein per pound of body weight if you're a relatively lean individual. If you're really overweight, then you want to use your lean body mass. That's where you take your body fat percentage, remove the body fat from your weight, now you have your lean body mass. Studies show this pretty consistently. Eating within this range means you're going to build more muscle, uh, which means uh, you know indirectly you'll have a faster metabolism and you'll typically get better results. Protein is also more satiating. So if you eat a higher protein diet as a percentage of your overall calories, you're more likely to eat less calories. Now, part of this is because protein itself is satiating. The other part of it is because oftentimes in a person's 
diet. Protein is where they get their whole natural foods. Yeah. If you look at the average person's diet and you were to just categorize their food in two categories, heavily processed and uh, unprocessed, most of the proteins uh, would be the unprocessed foods. In fact, that might, that might be the only things that they eat that are unprocessed. And unprocessed foods tend to also be uh, quite satiating. But, I, you know, there's this thing about macros and calories. It's that, uh, you know, they're important things to understand. You just don't want to get stuck uh, obsessing about them all the time. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you ignore them. You want to learn about them first. Yeah, I mean, like, definitely calories are, are you know, your first priority in terms of, like, being able to make sure that you're under a certain amount if, if my goal is to lose weight. But, you know, like, to, to bring it back to your satiating point, that was a big one for me to be able to, uh, you know, relate to my clients in, in, in terms of like being able to satiate yourself. So that way you're not still eating calories and it makes it easier. The process of like, um, you know, being able to delay the, the hunger onset. And so, you know, for, for me to eat like that was, was always like a better strategy than to try and just like minimize the amount of calories and keep that like same balance of carbohydrates mm -hmm. that I had before. Right. A 2000 calorie diet where the macros are not ideal means you're going to feel worse. You're going to have less energy, less strength, hungrier, maybe even a worse mood versus a 2000 calories uh, diet where the macros are ideal for your body. You're going to feel much better. Now it's more complicated than that, but those are the two big rocks that you got to tackle first is calories and macros. Understand them and learn them then you can kind of move into a diet that's a little more relaxed. We don't have to look at those things so much. It's funny that the bodybuilding community gets a really bad rap for this, but I actually really like the way a lot of them do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, many bodybuilders uh, don't even pay attention to calories. Mm -hmm. They only manage macros. Mm -hmm. And what, what ends up happening when you well, do that, if you manage macro, if you hit your macros, you're going to hit your calories. Right. right. And so, and that's all they focus on. They're not really worried if it's, you know, 20 or 30 calories north or south. That's less important to them as it is making sure that, okay, if I started off this muscle building program and I was allowing myself, uh, allowing myself 300 grams of carbs, 120 grams of fat, and, you know, 200 grams of protein, that's my starting point. And if I'm trying to build, I use, you know, typically carbohydrates or fats to increase those calories, and you can interchange those if you want. If I'm trying to cut or reduce, I reduce from carbohydrates or fat, and I can interchange those. And as long as I'm staying in a healthy range for my fat, I'm pretty good. And I think that learning to manage the diet that way, although it is a little more challenging for people, I think the lessons that you get from that uh, that will carry over into long term. Uh, intuitive eating if you can eventually get there. Because I think you have to do those things first. That's the steps. Oh, that's part of the education. Yeah, if you're ever going to get to a place of intuitive eating, I, I believe you have to get to a place where you're not only counting calories, you're also tracking macros. So you kind of get an understanding of what... I mean, in an example of why I think this is so important, I mean, to over 10 years into my career of even counting calories and doing things, I actually had never done... I never weighed a sweet potato until I started competing. Um, but in the past, when we started, this was well before, um, you know, Fat Secret, My Fitness Pal, we used to have to, we, I had a book called Calorie King. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And I would have to, you know, flip through it and I would look down and it would be sweet potato. Yeah, one it, medium sweet potato. Right. It would be small, medium, or large. And I would look at a sweet potato and I've got like five in my bag and I see what the large one is to me. That's the big one. And then I see what a small one is and then Oh, this must be a medium one. So I, you know, medium. That's it's a, it's a medium in comparison to the three that I have at my house. This is a medium one. So I put the meal. Oh my god, a little you off. Know, when I when I started weighing it, I wasn't just kind of off. I was three x off. Yeah, the, yeah. the medium is like a, bigger than their large. Yeah, yeah. it's big <laughs> exactly. And so that was such an eye opener for me. And you know, I so I was gu guesstimating my calories off by three hundred plus calories just from that one. Food and that there's examples of that in all kinds of different. Remember the uh, first time you weighed out five ounces of chicken breast? Oh yeah. You know, I you get those big old uh, you know monster chicken breasts that they make that they that are ten the, ounces. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, like yeah, a pound yeah. of chicken. You, know, you yeah. don't even realize it, and then you go and well, I need I'm supposed to eat five. Let's see what five ounces look like. Half. Right. Or you get a big juicy steak at a restaurant. You know, yeah. that's like a sixteen ounce steak. You <laughs> yeah. know what I'm saying? Like oh, oh, yeah. that's probably like oh, six or huge. eight ounces. Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's a lot of things that you there's a lot of value you get in 
you know, diligently tracking your macros. And I and I never recommend someone staying in that place to like Sal's point. I think you can become obsessive about it. I think that it could also lead to an unhealthy relationship with food. But there's a tremendous amount of value with tracking for a period of time for you to get a really good understanding. So at least you know when you go through your day, oh, I have a pretty good idea I was eating about this much, or I'm really low on my fats, or I or, or how I was really low yesterday on my fats, so today I want to make sure that I up those. And so I think that, that that's important. The true takeaway is that there's a Maxibon senior. 